I am Jeff, lead pastor of Northview Community Church in Abbotsford, British Columbia. And this podcast is where I get a chance to interview people about things that I'm interested in and talk about whatever I want to talk about. Hello, welcome back to another pre-conversation and conversation. Uh, I'm Levi, the producer, and I'm here. Is that here. what you're going to call yourself from now on, Levi? I am thinking I'm about Levi, the producer. You have like business, business cards. cards that you've got that way. You sign off all your emails. Levi, the producer. Yeah, yeah. It's and then actually... they're going to drop. Le- they're just going to drop the word name Levi, and then from now on, you're going to be called the producer. I wouldn't mind that. You're like Prince. Yeah. The, the artist. Right, but just producer. I like it. Not to be confused with pro. I worked at a produce in a oh, grocery dear. store. Yes. Levi, you are very good at the puns. I think that's why I have this role. Yeah, something Word, like that. Wordplay. Yeah. And no one else wanted to. Yeah. So. <laughs> Probably the latter. <laughs> okay. So we have a couple of conversation topics to get into. Again, more opinions to espouse. Hot takes. Are you ready, Jeff? Yeah, I'm ready for some hot takes. Very good. Uh, Canada okay. has expanded in recent weeks access to medically assisted suicide to include now not just terminal illnesses, but other things that are deemed to sufficiently decrease your quality of life. Yeah. you. T- I mean, everybody kind of talks about slippery slopes as a fallacy, but when you start seeing them slip, it gets a little bit crazy. Like, we can realistically start seeing a day where you know, people who have, have emotional or, or, you know, people like me, I, like I have a major depressive disorder. So that's like, that's my, that's my, my cross, you know, my, my uh, cross to bear in some ways. So I get really down. So there's a point at which I could get really, really down and just say, I don't want to live anymore, which is what sometimes happens. But if I go and I kill myself, right, I would take a gun and I kill myself. Everyone will say that's terrible. It was a horrible thing that just happened. He killed himself. But if I go to the government and have them kill me, then that's a cele- we should celebrate this as a good thing. In fact, that's why we made it a law, because I should have the right to do that. I, dude, it, that's broken. That's actually really, really bizarre. And since we're on the subject, dude, once, our, our culture's broken. Our government is largely broken when it comes to this. There was a guy, was t- I heard about a guy uh, just yesterday who has been in the hospital for the last while. Um, he had some issues uh, in the hospital. It's not COVID. Um, but when he, was, when he was there, he was an older gentleman, and when he was there, the doctor came in and said, you know, we, we do have a way for you to control y- y- how you go out, right? And so he was kind of, qual- you know, a re- doing an end run, talking about, like, hey, I don't want to say the word here, but I, I just sort of want you to know that you could kill yourself. You know, euthanasia is an option. And the guy, the old gentleman, he responded by saying, so wait a minute, like, you'll help me die right now. Like, if, if I want to go and I want to die, you'll help me die. But if I go out from here and uh, the COVID, with the COVID stuff, you'll, you'll keep me in my house <laughs> so that I can't actually live or see my family at all. But you'll help, me, you'll help me die. So you're trying to protect me from death out there, but in here you're trying to help me die. This is crazy. This is crazy. And, and honestly, they talk about uh, the culture of death in, in Western culture these days. It is a culture of death, dude. It's a culture of convenience and death. If we don't feel good, we, we, we'll kill ourselves. And if we don't feel like the baby is going to help us uh, you know, reach our, our potential, we'll kill the baby. Right? Just kill everything in your life that is not helping you be you. And honestly, uh, give me a break. It's such a bad way to live. So you think it comes out of this uh, really strong desire and feel to need to have uh, this complete autonomy over every aspect of our lives? Absolutely. Yeah. That's the, 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 the goal, the prime directive of people living in, in a secular West these days is self-autonomy uh, or, or self-actualization. That the more you get into you and know you, the better it is. And that really is what describes an identity politics. Just figure out who it is that you are and all the different identities you have. It's, it's what, you know, it, it, it explains most of the things that are going on around us. That you should, the biggest subject in the world is you. You are the greatest, you know, you're the center of the, of the play that you're in. 
and everyone else is a supporting character, which unfortunately is not the case. There's only one central character in the play, and his name is the Lord our God, and uh, everyone else is a supporting character to what he's, he's doing. And that reorientation actually is the most freeing thing that happens in the lives of people. Hmm. Yeah. I have another different question okay, different to ask question. you about. I'm not even going to try and transition smoothly. Uh, There's not a pun you could use to try to transition smoothly? I, so if there was more show prep that went into this, yeah, I probably could have could. had one. Oh, yeah, but forget it. Anyway. We Way try and keep it streamlined. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you about church history. Uh, mm. I'm an immersed student here. I've been doing some learning around... Uh, I've been studying a bit of John Calvin, some of the stuff he was involved in in his context. And I wanted to hear from you... Uh, one significant church history figure that you've enjoyed and benefited in learning from? Well, Spurgeon is the answer to that question. But he, because he was an amazing preacher and also uh, a good theologian and also, uh, you know, had a way with, with words and something like, so I, I find a lot of help with him. He was also maybe the most capable, like, with his time, he was amazing. He had a whole correspondence that he kept on with a whole bunch of other people. He would preach all the time. He had, like, he would preach some weeks, you know, several times a week, and he was always able to, to do it. I'm not like him though. He used to put together his sermons on a like Saturday night. <laughs> like he just sit down and he'd do the Saturday night special. I wish he would have done more. Um, expository stuff, meaning that he goes, he didn't ever really go through a book of the Bible. He would always, his, his sermons were always based upon text, so expository in that sense, but you don't have Spurgeon on Romans or Spurgeon on Ephesians or Ecclesiastes, whatever it is. You don't have him on that, which is a sad part of it, but ultimately I find I find him to be super helpful. He's also was a, a what, suffered with what they call melancholy, so as somebody who suffers with melancholy, I, I find it in encouraging that another pastor and uh, preacher in the history of the church had a huge impact, but also had that that difficulty. So, If someone w- wanted to start learning about Spurgeon, do you know, is there like a super accessible, yeah, helpful you know thing what? to most read? Of the, most of the, of the biographies of Spurgeon are, are, are great. There's actually a really good one out called uh, Spurgeon on the Christian Life and that I think you could, you could get. It's a little book, and um, it's excellent. And, you know, I have the collection of Spurgeon sermons, which are, I mean, they're quite amazing. Uh, so if you ever get into devotional life stuff, there are, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of books out there that are devotionals from Spurgeon, Morning and Evening, some others like that, but really helpful. Yeah, that's great. Uh, this actually transitions nicely into the interview we have for you next. Uh, Jeff sat down for a conversation with... Tim Clausen, currently the pastor over at Central Heights, but used to be a co-pastor with Jeff here. Uh, they talk about some of Tim's own uh, struggles that he has gone through, uh, his uh, view on why prayer matters, lots of other really important things. Uh, we think you'll really benefit from that conversation. So I'm looking through a plexiglass barrier at my friend Tim Clausen, who used to work at Northview Community Church years ago. Tim, how long ago was it that you worked at Northview Community Church? I don't know. Come on, Jeff, now, come I on. came here 15 years ago, and you were here. So mm-hmm. 15 years, and then you left. How long did you work here? Five years. Mm, five years. Seven five years. years. Right. Yeah. So I remain the best pastor you've worked with in your life. Right, you know, Tim? Whatever works for you, Jeff. Tim, that's five years really into good. your time here, you decided to leave. Was that because of me, Tim? Well, that's what people like to sort of, you know... They did. Actually, conjecture. when you left, I know. some people were like, do you hate Jeff? Did you say yes? Never. <laughs> Tim, it is so good to see you. Tim Clausen is the is the lead pastor at Central Heights Church currently. Central Heights Church, not Community Church. Central, Central Heights, Heights Church. Church yeah. yeah. Down at... Uh, it's the ski slope looking one that's off the highway. Isn't that beautiful? It is. It always looks like a ski chalet. It's it's great. But yeah. anyway, I just want to talk I want to talk to you a little bit about about your church, about ministry. You've got a great story about your background and where you came from and so I just want to get into all of that. I sure. think that your story is going to be really helpful and encouraging to 
lots of people. First, you need to just maybe tell people about yourself who don't know your name. Lots of people are listening know who you are, Tim, but mm. tell, tell them about yourself, your family, how you came to faith in Christ, that kind of stuff. Sure. So let's go back. Born. I was born in Were the you? United States, so you know we have a common bond there. Uh, parents... Um, my dad took some schooling in Kansas. So I was born in Kansas. Then he pastored in North Dakota and then Oklahoma. Pastor's kid. Yeah. And then how old were you when you lived in Oklahoma? Six. Six till how old? Seven. Oh, two years in Oklahoma. That could, that's like that's the great. name of that'd be the name of your book if you ever wrote it. Really shapes you. I actually revisited where I grew up there, and it was way smaller than I remembered it. <laughs> you know how that goes. Yeah. Then we moved to Calgary, so uh, uh, in my real formative years that way, grew up in Calgary uh, until about 14. Then we moved from the big city of Calgary to Yarrow, British Columbia. Wow. I, you can imagine how that went over with a teenager. Yeah, so you were thrilled. I was really thrilled. Yarrow is a really bustling metropolis for oh. teenagers. <laughs> I love that place now. I it's know. great to drive through but on the way to Cultus yourself, Lake. Hmm, 14, it yeah. was a bit rough. I had a really bad attitude for about six months, and then I changed it and uh, started to love it. Got into fishing on the Vetter River there. Mm. Made the best of it. So uh, fast forward, graduated from... Hold on, high- you're a hockey player. Some people might say that. No, no, you were a hockey player. You were like a legit hockey player. I was. Okay. Okay, so uh, I appreciate the false humility, but can you just tell me how... I don't know, the, like you could tell me anything at this point. Right. But you reached a certain level in hockey, and I don't remember what it is. Well, <clears throat> yes and no. I, um, when I was, I think it was 17, I was in a junior A camp. And uh, it's quite a story, actually. In that camp, I started to have pain down my leg. And uh, long story short, I could no longer skate, could hardly walk. Went to the doctors, and they told me I had what's called a Sherman's disease, which happens by growing too fast. And I wouldn't be playing hockey uh, for four or five years. So wow. that was it. So I, I don't really know how good I could have gotten because you have to play at every level, right? Right. To see what your ceiling is. So but never you loved got the it. opportunity. Hockey was your your thing. I loved it. Mm. Best yeah. sport in the world. Hey. Yeah. No. Um, do you you grow? <laughs> did you grow up in the? I can't follow it, Tim. I just got to tell you, man. I know. I know. I'm an outsider, and you, like, if you grow up with it, you can follow it. I have no idea where the puck is half the time. Mm. They do those replays. Sound and they're like, like, uh, they, sound like a grandmother I know. I know. She has the same problem. I know. Yes, I admit it. You know, there was I a time when just, NBC, they lit up the pucks. I know, so I remember that. that probably, in, you'd probably love the game if we could go back to that. It was the only time I knew what was going on. Oh, look, there it is. See, that's the thing. It's the fastest game in the world, which makes it the greatest game. Anyways, you probably don't want me to espouse yeah. on hockey yeah, this no, whole no. time. So uh, you grew up in a Christian family. Do you ever remember a time that you weren't Christian? Well, I, I can remember when actually it became real. My w- one of the few child, childhood rem- uh, memories that I remember, I was probably like five years old. We were having family devotions. My dad was really great at actually modeling what it looks like to disciple your, your family. And um, I mean, I recognize it now. I didn't know what was going on at the time. But the Holy Spirit came on me. I just started weeping. And my dad knew what was going on, and we walked through it. I prayed, and I believe that was legit. I believe, you know, God saw that, received that, and that marked my life. Not that, you know, you follow him 100% the whole way after that, but it actually was a marker in my life that I'll never forget. Was it So uh, at what point did you get the sense that you were going to be in ministry? Because that's really been your work right. in your life. Yeah, much of it. So I would say... Uh, In my early 20s, maybe 20, 21, um, again, I had an encounter with God that marked my life. Just um, all of a sudden, it was like he was drawing me after himself, and I was reading the scriptures. I was reading the Bible Were you just all alone somewhere, or were you... you Well, I was living... At that time, I was actually living with my parents, Mm -hmm. but I'd find myself reading the Bible till like midnight, one o'clock, two, and I just, like God was just stirring my heart, and... um, so he really marked me in that season, and uh, just at that point, that's when I realized, okay, I, I knew I was called to full-time church ministry at that point, because I sort of had resisted it, because my dad's experience was good at times, but I also saw the not-so-good at times. Yeah. What, so at what point did you become a goofy charismatic? Right around story? then. Yeah, okay. yeah, right around then, Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, damn. Not the goofy you part. Know, yeah. the, the <laughs> spirit part. Yeah. Um, you have a number of uh, daughters now. Oh, you got I do. married. How now? You know, I've had those same daughters for quite you, a while. But how have you? Uh, so you got married at what age and to whom? I got married at twenty-two. I married an older woman. She was twenty-three at the time. Mm. Her name was Virginia. And um, yeah, it's like I won the lottery. She was a legend in Abbotsford, and I'm the guy who won out. And you, you guys had three lovely girls together. Yeah. And yeah, I always thought the first one was going to be a boy when the doctor, you know, he's got the baby mm-hmm. in his hands and he says, oh, it's a boy. I was almost going to go, uh, actually, look again, you're wrong, but yeah. And they are, uh, your your oldest daughter is living in Vancouver now? No, she's in White Rock. Okay. She, she actually is a worship pastor at, uh, you know, one of those other denominations. Yes, I do. The Alliance. Don, don, we're going to have to edit that part out. Um, and then uh, your second daughter is Stephanie, mm-hmm. and she's married to uh, a great guy, and they live they live in Vancouver. They're yeah. in two blocks from Kitts Beach. Oh. It's, I love visiting them. I bet you do. Yeah. And your youngest daughter, April, and uh, she's thirty four. I'm gonna say, and uh, she's single, <laughs> but. There might be some changes oh, oh. in the horizon. Oh, yeah. It's, okay. It's, it's great. And I have four grandchildren. That's crank. Oh, yeah. That's right. Fantastic. Yeah. I haven't I seen you in a long enough time to know that you had grandkids. Yeah. And I did think I knew your daughters. Just didn't connect the dots there, Tim. Yeah, it's okay. That's fantastic. Uh, so you, the, one of the first things that you did as a pastor was try to plant a church in Vancouver, British Columbia. Mm-hmm. As I recall, you were part of another church, and then you just sensed that the Lord, you know... How did yeah. that come about? Why did you want to plant a church? Well, I think my wife and I knew early in the game, uh, following Jesus together, that at some point we were called to plant a church. I can't even explain to you why. I just had that. It was birthed deep inside of me, and I knew it was going to it was going to happen at some place. And we didn't want to rush it, so we waited and waited till it seemed like the timing was right. And then it was a matter of where. And you know, we lived in Abbotsford. Um, some of our friends said, hey, if you go like to Kelowna or Kamloops, we'll go with you. But we felt the call to go to Vancouver. And so uh, at the end of the day, one other couple did come with us, and we um, planted ourselves very close to City Hall in Vancouver, mm. um, rented a, a place there, and just you know started making friends and reaching out to people, developing relationships, and see what God had in store. How did you do that, Tim? This is what, what the 1980s? 90s. Uh, 1990. Yeah. Right so you, you moved to Vancouver in the 1990s. Yeah. And uh, you just start making buddies. I did. <laughs> yeah. So I played, wait for it, hockey on a team. Somebody said, why don't you join our church team? I said, are you kidding me? So anyways, I joined this team, didn't know anybody, and uh, over time became good friends with them and had opportunities you know, to share, with, hey, what, what I'm all about. You should have seen... Their uh, jaws drop about game four, though, we're, in the, we're, we're having a conversation. And somebody turns to me and says, hey, what do you do for a living, Tim? Oh, man, that was priceless. I'm a church planter. <laughs> Vancouver. Yeah. You can just see the wheels turning. On so the, what was Vancouver like in those days? Similar to now? Super secular? Yeah. Even in, in mm-hmm. 1990? Oh, yeah. 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 So found it hard, do you found it hard to connect with people or just disinterested in church? Or Well, I think... It's, it wasn't hard to connect with people, but then getting to that conversation about Jesus is a completely different story. But it's like your life insurance salesman. You know, everybody else is, uh, you know, a criminal, but your life insurance salesman is okay. So as you develop relationships with people, some of their barriers come down, their preconceived ideas, and over time, um, you know, you some of them open up to Christ. And we, we saw a number of people commit their lives to Christ. It was That's actually great. a really exciting time. Yeah. So uh, the whole Clausen family was involved in this. They were. So you guys were all singing and playing that, like, what? Right? Well, Amy was the oldest. At one point, she joined our worship team as a, you know, one of the primary singers. Yeah, yeah that's great. Children's ministries, your wife and the two other little kids. And yeah, yeah. So how many years were you in in the city trying to plant a church? Eight years. Eight years, and it went for for eight years, and then you, you left, and what happened? Uh, we came back to Abbotsford, and I was looking very seriously at pastoring another church. And um, again, one of those moments where you feel like God speaks to you really clearly and strongly. He said, no, you're not. 
So I had to basically walk away from that. Um, and I'm wired for that. And I went back into secular business. So I was a certified financial planner by background also. Yeah. And I went and helped my previous business partner with his business, um, make it through the Y2K ordeal and all that. And then we uh, also bought another business and I helped him, uh, um, climate, uh, you know, uh, assume all these other clients and, right. and whatnot. And then I, uh, I went to a church called Northview. <laughs> then they ended up asking you to be on their staff. Yeah. Yes. And then, uh, yeah. And the rest is, you know, here and then uh, working for Multiply, which yeah. is uh, mm-hmm. upstairs now and yeah. uh, ultimately at Central Heights. That's years. right. And how many years have you been at Central Heights? Eight years. And you like it? Love it. What do you love about it? What do you love about Central Heights Church? Tell me, tell, come on, Pastor. Sure. Brag on your church. For I don't that. want to sugarcoat it. Um, you know, it, it's a mixed bag. Mm. Like, you know, like we're every people. Church. Yeah, like we're people. But the things I, I love about Central Heights, first of all, I love my team. We have an incredible staff team, um, tremendous unity. I love the creativity and the confidence and safety there is with one another. So I love that. Um, I think our congregation, um, there's so many people that really love Jesus and just want more of what he has for us. And so, and that, you know, from our staff, our eldership, so many of our key leaders, like they just want to go with God. And so I feel like there's a green light that sometimes you don't have as a pastor to move forward. Um, And that to me is super encouraging. Yeah. Uh, What kinds of things are you guys doing right now that you're excited about? Um. Well, I mean, everybody's doing online ministry. Right. So, uh, how's that been? You getting used to looking at a camera? Uh, you know, the camera gives you no love. That's the <laughs> no, only thing. Doesn't. I'm <laughs> I'm trying to develop a relationship, but it's pretty pretty cold. Yeah. Tim, but, I've I've had a, a, a lifetime of having people give me that look, so it's not mm, that much different. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> it does grow on you. I've noticed it. that every MB <laughs> pastor seems to be doing it just fine, and I'm conv- convinced that's because they're used to looking at people who just sit there like a camera. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, I think also um, our church is growing in prayer. So the one one of the positives out of COVID, and there certainly are a lot of things that aren't, but one of the positives for us is I think our prayer life has increased. And so even like we've had a, an early morning Tuesday a.m. prayer for a long time, and there's way more people now showing up for that because it's on Zoom. You can roll out of your bed, you don't have to drive somewhere. <laughs> And, uh, you know, here we go. Let's go. Let's pray. So I think that's been really good, excited about that. And I'm excited about, you know, the creativity of our young team and where they see church going in the future and some of the maybe transition and changes that can take place with even how we do church. Tim, I'm a pastor as well. You need to tell me how I can help my church get better at praying. Hmm. I say that because you, you have a heart for prayer. It's been something really you know, not unique, but uh, central to your ministry, as mm-hmm. it should be for all of us. But you, in particular, more than more than most, turn to prayer very, very quickly and consistently. So I'm want to. I want you to tell me how do I get better personally at prayer, and how do I help others get better at prayer? Well, first of all, thank you for that. But you know, I'm I like everyone else. I know I don't pray enough, mm-hmm. and there's so much more that could happen that way. I, all I can tell you is what's taken place in my own life. And I think part of it is just God's grace and, you know, difficulties drive you to prayer. So when I was church planting, I realized early in the game, hey, you know, like we didn't have any support system like they do today and all that. I realized this is going to take a miracle and it drove me to prayer. So I would walk the streets of Vancouver, just pouring my heart out for the city. And I, I began to develop, it's like a muscle, I began to develop that muscle in relationship with God in prayer. Do you view it that way? Like it's it, it's something that's obviously difficult to begin with because the same thing as walking up a hill or running yeah. or whatever. You well, I, the analogy I would use is actually hockey. Is that okay? <laughs> Can I go back there? Sure, buddy. All right. So imagine saying, oh, I love this game of hockey. I want to be so good at Hold it. Hold on, I can imagine that. But I, <laughs> you probably can <laughs> But I don't want to learn how to skate. That's just not my thing, because it's awkward. It's difficult to learn. And man, what a great analogy for prayer. Sure, maybe at the beginning it can be difficult, and, and maybe not so much, but I think if, if you see the value of it, you see how important it is to even being a disciple of Jesus. I mean, look how Jesus modeled prayer. Yeah. You know, if he, if he had to 
you know, go to these times where he would retreat and go into prayer with the Father. How much more do we? And so, yeah, I think it's it's something you got to press through. Um, I think it's important to do it personally. So you asked about for your church, Jeff. I think as leaders, all we can do, it has to begin with us. And I fail in this way a lot of times, but like if I want my church to be praying, then I've got to be in prayer. And the first thing, I, one of the, not the first, but one of the things I can be praying about is that my church becomes a prayerful church. And right. so even that in itself can become God's answer. Have you found, you just mentioned walking around Vancouver. I've come across you before in, in Abbotsford in the morning, mm-hmm. uh, and you've been walking. Is that a practice that you, you use going on walks? Do you find that helpful? Yeah, I think everybody has to find... You know, what are the ways prayer really works for me? So there's um, two or three ways that work for me. One is journaling, and especially when I find I'm super distracted, because maybe I've got all kinds of issues I'm dealing with as a leader, then I find the best thing for me to do is actually take it to um, pen and paper, because it really focuses my thoughts. So that's really helpful. But then I also love to walk and pray. I just find the freedom of being outdoors and uh, I feel like I'm just walking with God and we're having a conversation, which to me is really what prayer is all about. It's I think Dallas Willard said prayer is a conversation with God about things that matter to us both. Mm. And so it's ju- not just me asking God for things, but it's, uh, you know, as you grow in your relationship with him, you read his word, hey, what matters to God? And now I want to pray those things into my my life, my family, my church, my my city, my nation, my world as well. Right. So do you do this uh, every day at the same time? Do you ever, and do you miss one, or is it kind of a little bit haphazard in that way? Yeah, I'm definitely not legalistic because I think that can be a real trap. But I do have a rhythm. So most mornings I start my day with I would say about 15 minutes of scripture, or just reading scripture, and then half an hour of prayer, and then and then I'll salt and pepper my day with prayer after that. Yeah. So it's not hours and hours like, you know, some of the great leaders of the past, but at least I want to begin with about 45 minutes with God on most mornings. There's some some days it doesn't happen, but I don't beat myself up for it. I, you know, it's all about relationships. So yeah. that's, that's how good. I look at it. That's good. Well, Tim, I've learned a lot about prayer. You took me to New York and I got to experienced some really great uh, prayer sessions. And that, that was fun. Do you remember how I pointed out the Empire State Building to you? Yes, I I, I do remember that. That's Tim. good. I was looking out a window. Tim's referring to the moment that I was looking out a window and saying how big that building was that was right next to them. And Tim walked over to the window and quietly said, that's the Empire State Building. After Jeff has told me he's going to be my tour guide for New York. <laughs> well, my sister-in-law lived there for a lot of years, and I'd been there to visit her with Repeatedly, I just didn't, it's one didn't of those, recognize one of those priceless moments. Tim, I didn't recognize the building from that angle. Okay, wow, that works for you, Tim. You had uh, like, I think one of the hardest things that anybody ever has had to face, and you've lived through it, and others, I think, uh, probably will have to live through it, um, and that is the loss of your dear wife, and and young. She was 50, 55. 55 at the time, and kind of sudden. Yeah. So, like, what, what happened? When did you find out that Virginia was ill, and, and how did that transpire? Yeah, <clears throat> so, and I'll try not to get emotional, because it still is, but um, she had been coughing and went to the doctor the first time they gave her some antibiotics, thought it was just a cold, and then she went back and they said, well, let's, let's, let's have a look at this, so they took some x-rays or whatever, And uh, yeah, I'll never forget the day I had been uh, away fishing on a weekend and uh, with my brother. And on the Monday when we got back, uh, she got back from the doctor's office that afternoon and said to me, uh, something's not right. And they're going to do some more tests. And um, yeah, that started a pretty difficult journey. Um, By the end of that week, uh, our doctor said, I want to come see you guys. So on the Saturday, which was the day before Father's Day, 2012, you know when the doctor says he wants to yeah, come over? Yeah, like, oh, you know, he not. doesn't usually come over. Yeah. For, yeah, yeah. so anyway, she was diagnosed with kidney cancer, which is often discovered by accident. It had already spread to her lungs, which is why the coughing. And um, we were told there would be no remedy, No, they wouldn't do radiation or chemo or anything like that. It was just a matter of writing it out. We did some blood immunotherapy, they call it. Um, 
but uh, from diagnosis uh, to death, she died the following year in March. Do they when when they talk to you? Do they give a, a time frame? Like was that the kind sort of sort of like they give you a window? I think she lived a little bit longer yeah. than they expected. I'm just wondering, like, how do you respond in that in that moment, <laughs> and what? Uh, what was it like in the days after that for you yeah. to come to grips with that? It's pretty surreal. I mean, it's always someone else's story. It's never your own. And it happens so fast. Yeah. Um, I mean, there were some really beautiful moments in all the pain. Two of our daughters were living in Quebec at the time. So on, on that weekend when we were told on the on the Friday, only one of my daughters was, was around, and she actually graduated from SFU that Friday. Mm. So we were celebrating, and she heard me have a conversation with the doctor. I told her not to tell her sisters yet because they were going away for this great weekend in Boston. Right. But she called them behind our back. They got on a plane the next morning, mm. and we were all together by like 1, 2, 3 in the afternoon right. on Saturday. Um, and you guys to, were together quite a bit. Yeah. During the next number of months. Yeah. Our girls didn't, they never went back to Quebec. They just had their stuff shipped out and and then we wrote it out. Yeah. So, so Tim, did you ever have questions in your mind about God's purposes or control or some people do that, others do not? Yeah. And what kind of, did you have strategies in your, like, were there things that you found helpful during that time and, and things that you found not helpful? Yeah, I think <clears throat> for for me, the most helpful thing was I was coaching at the time. I was coaching missionaries uh, in the gospel. We called it gospel coaching. And so here was an opportunity for me to um, practice what I did with others on myself. And the primary question that we used in this coaching model was... Um, how could this be for the glory of God? Mm-hmm. So how, how can I respond to this for the glory of God? So at one point, we actually sat down as a family. We took a whiteboard, and we mapped out what would it look like for us as a family to respond to this, and what ways could God be glorified? And of course, one of those would be she'd be healed, yeah. which we would pray for. That was one of our strategies. Let's pray for Virginia's healing. We got, I mean, there were people, because I was with Multiply at the time, there was people all over the world praying for her. Mm. Um, but then we also, out of that, we uh, felt that we should write a blog. So we did. We started a blog and, and um, you know, just shared our story along the way. Um, but I, I think what, yeah, what it boiled down to was it wasn't, the primary thing wasn't that Jim Virginia be healed. The primary thing was how do we respond to this in a way that glorifies God? And so we just really focused on that. Lots of prayer, trust. I mean, it's never easy. You watch your wife deteriorate month after month. It's, it's, it's really hard to watch. Um, but in the midst of it all, we just felt God's presence with us so strongly. And I was so, um, you know, so grateful that my girls didn't run away from God through this or didn't push them away. It actually drew them in. And so as a family, I don't think we'd ever been tighter. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, our relation, my relationship with my daughters now is so deep, um, because of this experience. Yeah. You took a pastoral work after this? Yeah, I was actually supposed to start, if you can believe this, on the weekend she died. Mm. So we obviously postponed things for... Did you ever have questions at that time about whether you would do it? Well, in the process of the conversations, uh, for me going to to Central Heights, I said, you know, if I was you, I wouldn't be talking to me. I mean, I've got a spouse that's dying here. Like, But I felt, I said, I'm open if you're open. And we both felt to continue the conversation. And um, honestly, looking back over the last eight years, it's been a real gift to me. Mm. Um, I've always said that if if I can't function because my wife's not in the picture, then my wife had an inappropriate place in my life. As, mm. as much as I miss her every day, God has to be more important in my life. And I certainly believe that he's given me, you know, as we all have a great purpose to live right. for. So what's ministry like? As, as a single man compared to as a married man, different? Some of it's the same. 
I mean, the the different part is, you know, I, like I used to love just debriefing mm. with Virginia at the end of the day, and uh, she was a woman that had real just great wisdom, and so I I really miss her input and her encouragement. Mm. Uh, of course, you're always the best at everything <laughs> you do, <laughs> totally right? Your <laughs> yeah. So I I really miss that. I also just miss watching her. Um, in ministry, I mean, she had a real gift of listening and a gift of wisdom. And so um, I think a lot of young adults were really attracted, and she would mentor some of these girls. And so just watching that was actually a lot of fun. And she also had a gift of hospitality, which I don't have. And so having people over was just, you know, really great. And it's a great way to develop relationships and, and to do ministry. You know, we're we're a little more unguarded. Yeah. And um, so I, I miss that a lot. So is it, so I'm just, my mind is, is going to some of what Paul says about being a single person, being able to commit yourself further to the ministry. Have you found that to be the case or has it been more of a, more of a difficulty? Like what you, what you miss is greater than what you've gained. I've never actually looked at it that way, but there are definitely, I mean, I don't think Virginia would let me get away with the hours I put in sometimes mm. now, you know, than if she was around. And I probably wouldn't even try to do that. So there is, there's more freedom to pour yourself in to some of the uh, different components of ministry than maybe you'd have otherwise. Yeah. You'd spend time, though, with uh, you find a lot of uh, community with your your family still. And oh, yeah. 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 My grandkids. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a whole nother world that I just really love. That's great. Tim, uh, I have uh, only one more question. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you eat Wendy's all the time now? And I'm asking you that, Tim, because you sold a piece of property, your church did, to Wendy's. Did they sell it or did you rent it? Do you we actually, are you the landlord to we Wendy's? We sold it, but we didn't know it was going to Okay, so for lunchtime, away. do you eat a Baconator? No. Why not? Because. Do you not get a special deal on Baconators from this Wendy's? <laughs> no, we don't. What? <laughs> Sorry. Is there a drive-thru in that Wendy's? There is. I'm going to come to that Wendy's sometime. Sure. And I'm going to go buy a Baconator, and I'm going to come and get it, give it to you. Love it. You're more than welcome to do I that, bet. Jeff. I bet. But we're all working from home now. I know, so it doesn't matter. Even Wendy's. No, I don't think they're working from home. Uh, no, that's, that's great. Uh, what would you say that Christians in Canada should be thinking about these days? Help the nation, Tim, mm. because the nation is listening. That's well, how important this podcast wow. what is. What a question. So are there more than just your relatives listening? No. no. Okay. Okay, Tim, help my relatives. All right. Oh, man, I mean, we're thinking about this all the time, aren't we? Um, I guess all I can share with you is what God's impressing on my heart lately, and and that is embracing suffering. Um, you know, not to fight so much for our rights. I think as we look at culture, we want we want to fight for our rights. We want, you know, things to be right. I have a, you know, a pretty good suspicion things are actually going to get worse, and that our goal is to glorify God and suffer well in that may very well be a big part of that. And so I think we, as somebody put it, we got to get the story straight. We have to keep coming back to what is the story of God? What is the gospel? And it's about a different kingdom, and it's about Jesus is Lord, if you read the book of Revelation, there's all kinds of, maybe there's all kinds of tribulation and persecution going on and difficulty, and sometimes that, you know, it sifts down into our lives in very <laughs> difficult personal situations. But Jesus is on the throne, and one day, because he died for us, he rose again, and he's ascended to the right hand of the Father. He will make everything right. right. But in the meantime, we've got a mission, and we need to be on mission and sometimes that mission calls us to suffer in the process. So if we can keep the story straight, keep our focus straight that way, uh, I think the church will do well regardless, you know, of what it looks like. Mm. That's good. Tim, I've often said that people should attend your church. <laughs> I mean it. I always laugh because I'm like, uh, you guys all know that Tim Tim Claus is the best pastor I know. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Anyway, listen, well, this is... Can I just You have a question. There? You have to ask me a question. First of all, you're one of my favorite preachers. I bet you are. I bet and, I am. And favorite people. <laughs> yeah. You really are. I love to golf with you. Um, I, okay, question for Jeff. What question would you ask God? 
the one, if you were given one question when you, you know, Ooh. in the future, and, you, and he's going to give you a straight up answer, what question would you ask him? Do you know, I normally, I, most people when they answer that question, I think would go to the theodicy, like the, okay, God, why evil, why the level of evil and that kind of thing. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily go, go there. I actually have a theological question that I that I want to ask, and it it has to do with the creation account. Mm-hmm. I just want to know how that should be read. Is that yeah. terrible? Oh. Like I just want I, look. I am really open handed with you know old Earth, young Earth, whatever. Right. I think mm-hmm. that there are you know some limitations to that. I'm not a uh, I'm not a theistic evolutionist. I think that there's some problems with that viewpoint. Although some of what they've said in some places, I can say, oh okay, but I. I am, yeah, I, I just, for years, it has been a, a challenge for me to think that through. Uh, my father was a geologist, and mm-hmm. I think that, that was, that's one of those back burner, you know, you put different questions that you have on the back burner of the stove, and I tend to be kind of academic, analytical, like to have the answers to things, and that's right. one of the ones that, is that horrible? No, what's horrible No, it is, that? it's horrible, because it's just a knowledge question. What I should be saying is, Lord, why didn't I love more people better? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I just, yeah, it's just an apologetic question that, I, that mm. I've often wanted to, wanted to know. But that's an honest answer. Yeah, it is, it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would also ask questions about. No, you just Lord, get one. Why about you? Just get why, one. Okay, no, well, yeah, there it is. No, it's like <laughs> that. Would he, is that what he's going to say to me? <laughs> Lord, I have another question. <laughs> nope, that was it. You only got one. You know, I think it's you all. You should listen be, to Tim. He it, said one. It's all going to be answered, I think, in the moment. I anyways, know. you're so. going to be like, well, it doesn't seem like such a big deal now, does it? As long as you got this straight, God created. Yes, He absolutely did. Uh, he absolutely. Tim, thank you so much for joining me for these few minutes. Uh, it has been a delight. Again, uh, Tim, Tim, are you on Twitter or anything? Not Twitter. Uh, Instagram and all that? I posted once three years ago. <laughs> okay. But if you want to know more about Tim, you can go to the website of Central Heights Church, Central Heights. Yeah, and then you can follow our church on Insta. There. Yeah, you can follow the church on Instagram, and it is a great, great church. We're so thankful for the partnership you guys have in the ministry in Abbotsford with us. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. It's As we are with you. Thanks, yes. Jeff, for the leadership you give, and yeah, for man. Northview. You know, great, great community of faith. Thanks, man. Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll see all of you next time. Thanks for listening to Conversations with Jeff. Make sure you subscribe to catch up on all upcoming episodes. So until next time, love God, do what you want, and don't be stupid.